Welcome to the 21st episode of Speaking of Poetry. I'm Rennie McQuilkin, publisher of Antrim House Books, whose authors are featured in this series. I am delighted to be joined today by Nora Pollard. Having begun to compose poetry in her mid-40s, she received the Academy of American Poets Prize from the University of Bridgeport, and for several years edited the Connecticut River Review, for which she used her skills as a visual artist to create memorable covers. Nora also illustrated a book of Japanese tanka poems published by Antrim House. During the last 10 years, she has written four volumes of poetry, the most recent being In Deep. She has read widely from her books at venues such as the Sunken Garden Poetry Festival, Yale and Brown Universities, the Rhode Island School of Design, and Arts Cafe Mystic receiving much acclaim for these readings, as well as for Garrison Keillor's renditions of her poems on the writer's almanac. Nora lives where the Housatonic River meets Long Island Sound and visits the river daily, drawing from it much of her inspiration as a writer. To keep herself extant, she has worked as a secretary in advertising law and software engineering firms, as well as steel companies, in earlier days, she was variously a folk singer, seam stitcher, nanny, teacher, solderer, and paint shop calligrapher. Phew. But all that time, she has felt the tidal pool of the words that shape her. Welcome to Speaking of Poetry, Nora Pollard. Thank you, Rennie, for that lovely inter introduction. Um, the first poem I'm going to read today uh, is called To My Son. And, uh, you know, I have actually met two people who claim that they have no regrets in their life. Uh, and I, I just find that, and they're very adamant about this, you know, and, and they don't know each other. One is a man, and he's about 30 years older than the woman who claims that she has no regrets. And uh, I think, have they never made a mistake? Uh, well, I mean, they've never... Ha made an error in judgment uh, that caused maybe some grief at one end or the other. But anyway, um, and, may and maybe they're just blessed, you know, they're blessed uh, in that they see everything as all good. Uh, anyway, this poem, I, I am one who, uh, I have a storehouse of regrets and um, uh, anyway, this poem is called To My Son. And I will explain just one word. Um, the Ao J is a is a um, Vietnamese, a woman's Vietnamese uh, dress. It's a it's has a mandarin collar, and it's long to a long tunic with slits up the sides, and it has um, under under that some long silk pants. Um, it, it's usually all silk, and they're very beautiful. To my son, two things eat at my heart. I used to tuck you in every night. It was a joy for both of us, the giggling, the cuddling. But when you were six, a friend, a professional, a social worker, brisk and sure, raised her eyebrow at my telling of the hugs and said, he is too old for this. How do you know how to raise a child, to love a child? She was the authority. The psychology was in the books. And I was young and a fearful mother, weak in my own intuitions. After your bath that night, I told you There'd be no more tucking in. You were too old for that, I said. You wept hard. I wept outside the bedroom door. And when you were 10, you discovered the Ao Jie, a man I'd loved, had sent me from Vietnam. The tunic was a pigeon blood red, the color of rare rubies embroidered all over with black flames, black threads outlining a gold phoenix on the back. The long pants were of heavy black silk. 
You carried them down the attic ladder and, clearly in love, begged to keep the silks that shine so darkly from another world. But why do you want them? I asked. Fatherless, no man to follow, and frail as a girl. Your love for the silk disturbed me. And two, the Auge was so beautiful, preserved these many years. I could not see them ruined by a child's play. I said, no. You cried, please and please. You smooched and smoothed the satin. You held it to your cheek and you rubbed it on your upper lip. But I took the satin from you and folded it and said, no, again and climbed the ladder to the attic to lay it back in its black lacquered box where it rots today. Now you are a man. Forgive me, my son. Forgive me these base sins against love. And um, the second poem, you know, um, I realize that the Constitution guarantees us the, the right to this pursuit of happiness. Um, but it doesn't say anything about capturing it or, you know, um, attaining it or keep holding on to it. And, uh, and, and anyway, I've always thought that happiness is kind of a, a first world uh, myth, you know, that... Uh, a myth for the well-to-do, actually. This is called happiness. Are you happy? Don't ask yourself that question. The answer is so often, no, not yet, not quite, tomorrow. I used to be. If you say, yes, yes, you probably mean, I'm not dead yet. Things could be worse. Someday my prince will come. I am happy in the Lord, though he never comes to tea. You might even think you mean content. The cow in the meadow is content. Does that mean the cow is happy? The suckled baby is finally content. Does that mean the baby is happy? One day in the parking lot of the super, super store, you'll be walking across asphalt to get your prescription for your thyroid issue, your cholesterol issue, your anxiety issue, and possibly you're also going to pick up some cat food. You'll be dodging cars and shopping carts, eyes half time on the ground looking for change, when you'll happen to look up indifferently and see a marvelously wide blue sky full of moving herds of round white clouds. Then you'll see a small yellow bird flung like a buttercup by the wind across the span of blue. Your heart will give a hop as if paddle jumped. Everything will brighten. You'll feel shoeless and light as egg white. You may even laugh softly to yourself, a little like the mad woman in the attic. It all lasts seven seconds. Then, wonder all through your body, you go into the store to get the meds that keep you poking along and the cat food that keeps the cats content. And that was happiness. So quick you might have missed it. That's how it comes. Be ready.
the yellow bird says. You know, sometimes uh, you are only dimly aware that you're not happy. And um, I think we should be alert to our states of mind and, and not just plod through life uh, with, with, with a life that has no joy in it. Um, and sometimes we have to change our lives. This is called The Taxidermist Woman. I was never so lonely as when I lived with a taxidermist who mounted wild animals in the back barn. He was a genius. His quail, bear, and deer head seemed alive. So full of grace and spirit, you stood and waited for them to blink. I loved the man for his connection to the animals, to the wild. I loved him because he was animal and wild. He lived free of ideas and social niceties. And the two of us le lived a lean life isolated and unladen by aughts. But beyond my good winter stew, brown bread, sex, and laundry, he did not want to know me. He did not like me to talk. And for all that, we lived a peaceful life. There were his old and constant angers like small brush fires I could not tamp out. With moons and tides, these angers would flare to rage and all but destroy us. Last winter, some nights while he slept his angry sleep, I began to visit the barn where the animals all stood or perched or lay or crouched. I breathed in the smell of clay, salt, stink of bear grease, tanning solution, fur, and old blood. I stood for long times in the dark with the animals. I found some comfort there. One night, the moon came through the barn door and lit their glass eyes. The gray wolf with his sad, frozen smile. The bear on his hind legs. And the antlered deer looking down from the rafters. The pheasants, wall eyes, fox, and, and silvered stoat. They said to me, run. Without moving their lips, they said to me, run. And I remembered what it was to have the heart addressed. Early next morning, I left him while he was busy gutting a deer. OK, um, you know, I, I forgot. Uh, I need these now in between the last time I read and, and this time, my drugstore glasses. Um, this poem, you know, many of the poems uh, that, I, uh, that I write are about the people in my town. Uh, there they are. And I don't think that you need to go to Paris or Australia to find uh, interesting people. Um, this poem is called On Dean. For many years in my town, a beautiful Haitian woman in long skirts and a yellow and orange head tie would walk all day long up and down Main Street, pulling a small two-wheeled cart filled with things useful and useless, a fly swatter, an umbrella, a nosegay of yellow plastic zinnias, clothing, neatly folded, a rubber baby doll, white, many balls of tinfoil, a raggedy Red Sox pennant, okay. 
a pair of child sneakers. Up and down Main Street, she would walk all day, head high, smiling ahead at the horizon as if she saw some vision there. One day I stopped and asked her name. Andine, she said and smiled. She did not ask my name, but asked instead, what do you do to work? Oh, I said, I I'm a secretary. And when she scowled, I added, at the steel mill. And when she still scowled, I added, like a child, I write poems sometimes. She beamed, then rooted through her cot until she found a tin penny whistle. Here, she said, I've been waiting to give you this. Waiting. I protested, of course, she had so little. I said I did not know how to play the whistle. She laughed a loud and husky laugh, showing all her great square teeth. And once you did not know how to write a poem. And she went away laughing. I taught myself to play the penny whistle, and when I'd see her now and again, I'd pull out that fipple flute and play Clementine rake and ramblin' boy, red light ladies. Then we'd laugh together for a little while until she'd say in her sing-song lilt, I got to get along, I got to get the train. And she'd sweep off majestically toward the train station, or not, dragging her cart. Ondine's gone now. It's been a year. Sometimes I'll take the whistle out of my bag and play Chicken is Nice or Suzanne out behind the library by the cemetery gates. I can hear her laugh. How did she learn to laugh? Ondine, Ondine, our Main Street Queen. On what train did you leave, and to where? I also, at my uh, um, aging body, I, I, I have gotten to read the obituaries lately. And that's a sure sign that you've got two feet in the grave. But anyway, um, this is a poem uh, about a man that I wish that I had met. Uh, and it's called The Pumpkin Lover. For Stephen James Jepson, 1962 to 2011. He is handsome and his eyes are kind. He looks out from the stamp size photo as if he were eager to know you. It says here he was an arborist and a lawn care expert. Not for the little lumpy lawns on Stratford side streets. It says he nurtured the great field at Yankee Stadium and the Staten Island Yankees field. He had a beloved wife and a beloved son. And he had a passion. He had a passion for growing giant pumpkins and became respected worldwide for his expertise. I smile to read that. The obituary says this man, this pumpkin grower, is dead at 46. I read and reread the obituary looking for a reason besides sclerosis a good man should be dead at 46 but he's blameless, an Eagle Scout, a father, a pumpkin grower, and a life not lived half enough. But he had a passion, 
and it is passion that makes a life. To be obsessed, to be so focused on some beauty of the world, an art, a sport, a woman, a pumpkin, that you can love and love and love almost without self. This is the richest life. You were lucky, Stephen James Jepson, to love the orange pumpkin. And the pumpkin, in its tubby, golden-seeded hot, is grateful to you for encouraging its humble, viney crawl upon the earth, for watching over its yellow trumpet blossoming into the furry pod, for mothering the pod ball's ribbed gold round into the great and perfect pumpkin. Your spirits in the green grass infield, Stephen. Your heart is in the fragrant pumpkin patch. Your passionate years are in the fruitful ground. Um, and there are other people in my town uh, uh, people that are um, also fascinating. Um, uh, there is a group of people that rather, they spend most of their days down at Bond's Dock, which is a little dock there. It's a working dock. You won't see uh, no yachts down there, but you'll see uh, the clam boats and the oyster boats. And, uh, and then there are people that, uh, as I said, spend their days there. They might uh, carry around a little uh, bag, brown bag, with uh, something elevating in it. And uh, this is a poem called Insurance. He is crazy in that slant kind of way you don't catch on to right away. He believes that frequent bathing leeches the get out of your body. He believes moles cause earthquakes. He believes a woman can get pregnant if she swims through pond scum. He believes if you dream of a white bear, you'll die at the SIF in a month. He believes they never put a man on the moon. He believes in drink. Back some years when his baby daughter was born, his woman pleaded with him to sign up for life insurance. No, he slammed the table. But I'll pay for it, she pleaded. God damn it, no, he shouted. No one is ever going to profit from my death. For the baby, she pleaded, for love. Love is not money, he said, and threw the fry pan through the window. Now she's left him. Vodka's become his vocation. He slept under the Moses Wheeler Bridge until the poison the town set there for the pigeons made him sick. So now, most nights, he'll sleep in the weeds near pilings beneath Brown's bait shop. He hardly talks anymore. Sometimes, though, sitting on the dock full of hooch and pride and fury, he'll get to telling Silvio or Buddy or the van man that old insurance story, how he never had let them play him for a sucker, how no one is going to profit from his death. Well, Silvio will always muse, chewing on his dead cigar. The worms might. Um, I am always, I've always been haunted by the bombing of Dresden uh, in World War II. Uh, it's just something that sticks in my head uh, like a regret. <laughs> and uh, um, I'll just read you this. Uh, I, I want to explain one word, but, I, 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 but before that, I just want to tell you that uh, I have to always remember what Plato said, which is, only the dead 
have seen the end to war. Um, Abaddon is uh, it's from the book of Revelation and that is simply another name for Satan or the evil one. In the Museum of Memory and Beauty. My friend is mourning the Christmas ornament she's found broken at the bottom of a box. I tell her it's a wonder anything survives. I tell her the Chinese urn passed down for generations ended up in pieces on my kitchen floor. I tell her the dog chewed the knuckles off the lion paw feet of the 200 year old terry wood table placed in my care. I say it is a miracle that all the ancient treasures at the Tate made it to safety there. But tonight, I can't stop thinking of Dresden. I hear the red roar of the firestorms bringing down the Frauenkirche, the Grand Palace, the magnificent Opera House. I hear the tinkling and splintering of chandeliers, the fracturing of fine statues, the beautiful paintings crackling, burning. The people, the beautiful children, breaking, burning. I hear their terrible cries. Come, let us place our dear ornaments around us. Let us enjoy our tea in Dresden china cups. Let us be pleased by Degas' dances, all that happy, happy pink. Let us pat our smiling lips with, with silky Hirschberg damask. Let us cut bread on this old oak Jacobean table. Let us move closer to one another's beauty. Come near. Abaddon, the destroyer, walks the halls. Thank you. Nora, thank you for that glorious reading. Uh, I think uh, that even if they lasted uh, for uh, only uh, a few minutes and more than seven seconds. In this case, you've given us some exquisite moments of happiness. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, you have led us to uh, uh, follow our, uh, our passion, whether it's for uh, pigeons or poetry or pumpkins uh, or whatever it is. And uh, I believe we're uh, more likely to get out our precious objects that our mother said never to use and use them, Abaddon being in the hall, but for the moment, the precious objects being in our hearts. And we thank you for such a glorious uh, reading and uh, for helping us uh, along our paths. And, uh, and also, uh, I, I do want to thank uh, Ken Picard and Karen Handville, who make this program possible. If you would like to learn more about Nora Pollard and read samples of her work, please visit the Antrim House website, antrimhousebooks.com. You may be interested in other Antrim House poets as well, whose lives and works are described on the website. Goodbye for now until we meet again next month for the impossibly 22nd installment of Speaking of Poetry.